Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Gay With God podcast, a safe place for us to share our stories and support one another. How long did we know? What challenges did we face? Did we lose our faith? When did we find our way back home? Or are we still searching? The stories you hear on this podcast will melt your heart and strengthen your belief that in God, all things are possible, and you can be, authentically, gay with the God of your understanding. I am your host, Midge Noble, and I am very honored that you are here. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Gay With God podcast. And as always, I tell you every week, thank you for sharing, subscribing, reviewing, and giving this podcast some visibility so the people who really need to see it and hear it will find us. So thank you so much. Today, I have a return guest that I'm so excited to bring to you, or, or I guess bring back to you. Carter Holmes is back in the Gay With God house. And why is he back? Because we're going to go a little deeper, dive into some really specifics with Carter because he not only speaks and life coaches and organizes retreats for gay Christians, he is now a bona fide published author. Yep, he did it. Now this week, he's going to have his launch for his new book, Happy Gay Christian Hereafter, Eight Steps to Reconcile Your Identity to Family and Faith or Leave Without Regret. And I love that part. Leave without regret. That's a biggie. I can't wait to figure that out for myself sometimes. <laughs> so what is Carter's mission? Give people permission to choose their beliefs. Carter lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And this Thursday, as I said, he is going to launch this book. And I'm so excited to be a part of that. I'm going to the launch. We will connect you later in this podcast on how you can be a part of the launch. You don't want to miss out. So let's just get started. So Carter, welcome back to the Gay With God podcast. Thank you so much, Midge. It's a you pleasure are, to be back. You are so welcome. So as an aspiring uh, a published author myself. I can't wait for my book to come out. And I'm just sitting in the glow of your smile right now that this is your week, that your book is launching on Thursday. So let's talk a little bit about what inspired you uh, to write Happy Gay Christian Hereafter. I am turning 30 mm. a week and a half after this is published. Okay. And it was a dream of mine three years ago to write a book that made use of what I felt like was wasted experience and wasted years of my life mm. in trying to reconcile with people who don't want to reconcile. Mm. And I say that with love because I love my family. I love my church and I love where I come from. And I never want to forget where I come from. Mm -hmm. I'm still, I, I find myself doing things my mother used to do, like hanging <laughs> eucalyptus in the shower in the fall because it helps with congestion. Oh, that's a really good tip. Okay. We didn't know we were going to get some, some good advice on that, but that's uh, great. That's a good idea. It okay. is. It, I'm just so happy with how in a lot of ways I've been able to leave without regret. What inspired me to write this book is that I pretty much tried every available career under the sun for me, mm -hmm. which included being a concert pianist and then applying to medical school, then working in the medical system, then working in pharmaceuticals, working in the laboratory and research for vaccines, traveling for that work and working as a professional actor, actually going to medical school. And so I went to medical school for a year. The actual event that prompted writing this book was this year, I was in medical school in April. I was doing very well. Dean's list, like top three of my class. And I just realized something was dreadfully wrong with my support system because during COVID I had, after all those travels, reunited with family and was trying to make things work. And I had done new things and I'll cover that in my book. They're very constructive exercises you can do on actually reconciling with real people when it's very difficult, but mm -hmm. I just didn't have enough clarity on how to understand quality relationships, knowing when it's actually a supportive relationship and when it's not. Mm -hmm. And so I let people in way too quickly. And I had a past of major depression in 2016 when I first came out. And the only other time I experienced depression was this year. It was really bad and I knew where it would go. 
and the school psychiatrist said that your health is more important. I was like, you're right. It is. It's more important than these awesome grades than I've worked around the clock for. Mm. And so I, I, I checked myself into a mental hospital and I just knew this is the quickest way to get the meds, quickest way to see the doctors. And I was there for a week. And when I came out, I drew with crayons like I had when I was there. And I was just remembering what I used to dream, which is one of my steps. This book is a long time in the making, but I diligently worked every step of this over the next eight weeks after coming out of the hospital. And I realized very quickly who supportive relationships were and who were not. I just realized, you know what? The only thing I have to be out this summer, the psychiatrist has told me not to go back to school. So I need to do this now. It's time. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to speak. Mm -hmm. And so while it started out as a, a personal thing, me wanting to achieve a goal before age 30 and wanting to kind of redeem the things I felt bad about for my life, what felt like failures and setbacks, I came to realize that only one third of my book is about me in terms of like me telling my story. I have so many other people in this book who have helped me develop various parts of these steps or been actual clients that I've worked with at this point. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here to give people permission to choose what they believe, but also help people to build high self-esteem by respecting themselves and respecting mm -hmm. their feelings. So. so these eight steps are actually a culmination of things that you personally have experienced and gone through and learned how to deal with your own reconciling of people's relationships, but also from clients so that these are, these are steps that have worked for either you or someone else so that you feel pretty confident that if someone needs these steps and follows these steps, that they will also be able to achieve either the reconciliation they want or to leave without the regret. I feel 100% co confident in promising people that every single one of these steps will give you the love you need to thrive. Mm. It's about you learning to trust yourself and learning to love yourself first by respecting yourself. People say you love yourself and that never helped me because I didn't quite understand what that meant specifically. And mm. maybe it does help some people, but I didn't understand how to respect my feelings and go from cleaning myself up on the inside to having something to offer on the outside. And so I have personally worked all these steps. Some of my clients, you know, if they don't want to say invest in God, they, they may not work that step as much. Or if they don't want to read the Bible at all, they may not work the step on believing in the Bible that you read as much mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate goal that I have for myself and for others is to give them the dignity they deserve so that they can for themselves take responsibility for their own happiness because happiness is an individual individual responsibility. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody can, and no, nothing can make you happy. It is, it is an inside job, isn't it? I mean, it, it comes from within no matter what circumstance. Cause if you look at people from very disadvantaged countries, you know, no Wi-Fi, no, no football games, no, no beer. <laughs> and they're still, <laughs> and they're still happy <laughs> they, because they have a sense of their own contribution to the tribe, or they have their own sense of contribution to the, to the world around them. And, and they just live in happiness because they choose that it is a choice. Um, not that there's not devastation, not that they're, uh, unhappy when water comes to their village, but, but they, they don't have that sense of, I have to prove myself, you know, they are a part of a community and they cooperatively work together to sustain each other. And it's that caring for one another that brings them, I think so much joy. And we, we lose that here in, in the States. I think we, we lose that ability to be happy in whatever circumstance we're in. Um, so Ooh. let's go into some of these steps. Let's let's um let's go deeper. Dive deeper with Carter Holmes. <laughs> dive deeper. I will forewarn you this book is 300 pages. Yeah, so, so we're not gonna going talk to talk about everything. <laughs> no. We're not gonna speak 300 word or no. 80,000 words here. Yeah, Don't no, worry. We're not. We're not. <laughs> 
we're going to <laughs> overview so that therefore you as the listener can then be the reader and get your own stuff from it. But we want to let you know, this is kind of like your sneak peek into Carter's uh, book and, um, and what these steps could look like for you. So start wherever you want, I guess at step one, but um, yeah, so go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead. No, you go um, ahead. <laughs> sounds good. So I have rehearsed what I was going to talk about, but I just feel like I should talk about the example client in each of these stories because I have a story, at least one for each step. Okay. So the first step is to reveal your feelings to remember your needs. And when I first worked this step with a client, it was after I worked it for myself in 12 step, because if you remember from the prior podcast, I went to a 12 step group for sex addicts because I thought the last thing I can try to change myself is pretend my orientation is because of some sort of lust problem. Mm -hmm. And my sponsor told me I was just gay. I wasn't an addict. And so mm -hmm. I left despondent. But what I did take from it was an anger and fear inventory and something different that I wanted to give people from 12 step is that your feelings are a good thing. Mm. In this step, I worked with a girl named Lucy. She was actually in medical school and she was one of the most stable people I knew. And she came unhinged one, one time. I just went into Carter mode, I guess. I'm just so confident that if you can answer the question of how do you feel, and there are five main feelings, which is happiness, joy, sadness, anger, or fear. If you're asking the question, it's probably anger or fear because you're having a problem. And pinpointing how you feel, she could reveal her thought that was prompting it because thoughts always prompt feelings. And so her thought was that she was scared of being alone as a medical school student and scared of being a professional and going home and being alone. And that reveals a need for safety and security and belonging. And when you know your need, you can meet your need. And when you meet your needs, very predictably, you feel happiness and joy. Mm -hmm. And that was a really formative moment for me because I was just trying to be a friend to help her. And it unnerved me a bit because I had never seen her stressed out. And Lucy's a pseudonym. All the names are pseudonyms in the book. Mm -hmm. But she's a real person. And so once I did that once, I just had so much confidence in my own feelings. And that gave me the confidence to leave medical school and mm -hmm. go take care of myself. Because I was like, right. no, I know how to take care of myself. And I'm confident in how I feel, no matter what other people say. That is the first step. It's so important to me that, and, and a lot of times clients will come in and they don't like this stuff. I'll do this thing called a feelings journal where there'll be a series of questions and I'll start them out at the beginning of their day because they're usually having a really hard time. They might be going through a breakup. Sometimes I had this heterosexual woman in Kenya as a client. She did a great job on this step, but most people are scared of confronting their angers and fears and they want to skip over it. So the point is, is that it's a skill to develop and it's foundational for all the other steps. And that's why I talk so much about it. The others will be quicker. <laughs> <laughs> step, right. two, step, step two. Step two <laughs> is um, ache openly. Ache openly to grieve because heartbreak ends. And in this step, I take another principle from 12 step, which is being present with other people in your suffering. It's very important and I cover the five steps of grief, which I mentioned in the prior podcast. I use Elizabeth Kubler Ross's five stage model, which is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But when I started writing this book, the profundity of this step really came to me because I had to grieve a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I was dealing with my real life problems through writing this book as things became more clear i had to tell some people it's like look you don't accept what i believe if you don't accept how i feel and if you don't accept what i think or need then one i can't be a part of your life i just can't and then two the last step of grief is acceptance and if you never get there you are forever going to be in denial which mm -hmm. prolonged is insanity 
And if you're forever in anger, you're going to have chronic health issues. Mm -hmm. You might have anger management issues. And if you're ever in bargaining, then you'll be a chronic manipulator. And if you're forever in depression, then you will end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And some people can sustain it. They have stronger personalities, but depression is just a symptom of giving away your energy in ways that doesn't meet your needs. Mm. All I can do is give. And if people are serious, they'll take it. If they're not, they won't. Right. And I'll go ahead and skip ahead to the next step, which is three. I'll just uh, one more thing about step two is I like it because I feel like it really rounds out a rock bottom place for someone. If they're able to get through an anger and fear inventory and honor themselves and discover what they need and accept facts as they understand them. And it helps to have a third party there mm -hmm. to help you discern. This is your experience. Do you agree? These are the facts mm -hmm. because it's very emotional, but if you can latch onto the facts and work on accepting the facts, it can feel like a very difficult experience, but you'll get through it. Yes. As long as you're open about it, if you keep it inside, I can't say you will. It didn't work for me, but aching openly to grieve will end heartbreak. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Mm -hmm. I used to tell kids that I worked with that, that our feelings were like a lake with all the water. And if you try to go around it, you're only going to go in circles. But in order to get through that feeling, you have to go through the, the pain uh, to get to the healing on the other side. And so it's a journey that's sometimes sluggish and you feel like you're getting stuck in the muck. But that if you continue to move forward and you get to the other side, you don't have to keep circling around to that same ache, like you describe it, that ache or that pain or that unresolved Absolutely. feeling. You have to go through the pain to get to the healing. Absolutely. And it takes a while. For, people have to decide what they want to do. And so the next step is to invest in God if you want to. And mm -hmm. I had a client recently, I'll call him Kyle, who he worked the other steps kind of. He didn't like the first step. And I can understand why. Nobody likes being at rock bottom <laughs> and nobody likes dealing with their stuff. Nobody right. does. Yeah. But if you do it, then you will come out of it and you'll realize how constructive it is. And you'll have a framework for dealing with challenges in life. So when he approached God as a person, because in this step, I asked people to put the Bible down and stop going to church for two weeks until step five, approaching God as a person, I said, the point of this, and there was one point where he was ready to listen. And I helped him to pray to God in such a way that he shared his feelings, his garbage thoughts that were behind his angers and fears and his needs. And then I said, this is literally what I do. And it can work for you. You don't need God to do it, but God certainly helps. And that's a practical mm -hmm. reason for God and a compelling reason for investing in God is because he's a friend that will invest back in you. <laughs> and the best way to really solidify a friendship is to honor someone for what they're good at. And what's God good at? Well, I think he's good at taking your garbage thoughts and taking things into his care, concerns into his care, if you're willing to give them to him. And he's also a person. And these are my ideas, yes. But I don't think I'm the only one who thinks them. Maybe the one who's articulated them. But if God's a person as well, like us, that means he also has feelings, thoughts, and needs. Mm -hmm. Which means that it's resonated with him, Kyle. That mm -hmm. God is a person. What could he possibly need from me? Well, if he wants a quality relationship from me, then I give him what he needs and he gives me what I need and he needs glory. That's the nature of God. And he's good at managing things. So I think that he's a, a candidate worth considering for helping to continue that step one and step two reality check and grief process. And in this step, he ended up going back to step one. He was like, oh, now it makes more sense. Why? I actually would want to be able to talk about my feelings because if I can share it with God, then I can actually have a place to put it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sometimes it clicks out of order for people and yeah. it's yeah. just a way of organizing the material that has worked for me. Yeah. Step number four is to notice how forgiveness frees you and 
give the gift of reconciliation. Mm. So in this step, I go through defining what forgiveness is and what reconciliation is. And I think it's in everyone's best interest to forgive, which I believe is committing to having positive feelings towards people. There are specific ways you can do that. But if you've done the work of assessing your angers and fears, a lot of people will end up on that list. Mm-hmm. And I find it, it will clean your life up if you do this, because then you won't, if you're in step four and you're forgiving people, you won't have memories crop up that make you want to run and hide, or you won't have memories where you just feel really angry, or you, you just won't be debilitated. You'll just be free from this minefield that was once your dangerous life. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't it something like grace as well? Because, you know, forgiveness is all about giving to someone else what we would hope somebody would give to us. So it's 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 a reconciliation between tr- troubles between people. You know, we reconcile and forgive because none of us are go- going through this world blameless. And there are times mm-hmm. that we all need forgiveness. And in order to forgive, we need to also be willing to, you know, We want to be forgiven and we have to be willing to forgive. So absolutely. Yeah, that's a brilliant step. I'm so glad you have that in there. (laughs) I do want to say one more thing about it, just because Mm -hmm. forgiveness, I think it's smart to forgive everyone. It's in your best interest to, because the point is to be happy. Mm -hmm. And what I think I said, I promise then you'll find the love you need to thrive a little bit of it anyway, in each of these steps, if you take it seriously. And if you commit to having positive feelings towards people, which I cover how to do that in the book, then you'll have happiness and joy and you'll be open to receiving love back. One caveat I cover in this in terms of reconciliation, because I don't think one is obligated to reconcile with anyone. Mm -hmm. I think it's a gift. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think people confuse love versus asking for favors. So love in my book is giving energy with no strings attached and you have to have something to give in order to be able to give so if you're empty you're running on empty and you're living in angst and stuckness you're not going to be able to really reconcile very well so yeah that's just to put that aside for a little bit until you feel happy in yourself and happy in god and then reconciliation is sometimes people won't take gifts they'll reject them and you can't control what other people do Mm -mm. So it has to be, and it helps to have another person as well to advise on how to do it, Mm -hmm. but it has to be, reconciliation has to be without expectations. Yes. And it has to be without asking for something. I go into the nuance of that in the book, but a lot of people have either, they might've started out in a very, very loving relationship. Say two people have relationship tension, like a couple Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's post breakup after a bad breakup and the person still wants the other one back. I mean, in that case, that is not a d- dynamic that is working. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, both people would already be giving to each other and that they, they can certainly work it out, but it's never going to be love if one person is trying to drag what they want out of the other person, what they need. And it's a choice for the other person in response to a gift of love a gift of reconciliation, which is really being honest about your heart. If you choose to be open and share your feelings and your thoughts and your needs with someone, you're choosing to trust them with that and they can choose to honor or not. And if they don't want to, they won't. I cover and hear the importance of having very high boundaries because a lot of times people are in the mess they're in because they haven't had, they haven't articulated boundaries very well in the past. And maybe their relationship slipped into a different direction. Right. Next step is believe in the Bible that you read. This is where I personally think it's best to pick up your Bible with some expectations. And I was raised to believe that the Bible I had in front of me written in English was itself the inspired word of God. And I still... I don't say much of what I believe in the book, but I'll say that I go with the assumption that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And that's the way I talk about it. However, whenever any imperfect human being has touched the Bible, they've introduced some imperfection into it. Correct. And so 
the church is what now at least 2000 years old. And so that's a long time for imperfection to just be <laughs> clicking along. And I'm not here to cast doubt or dishonor anyone just to be realistic mm-hmm. and to recognize the facts that, you know, you want to be a Christian. What does that mean to you? Does that mean that you want to align with an organization that's imperfect? Or does that mean you want to actually read the essence of the Bible, which is to follow Jesus, which is what I believe to be the essence of Christianity. And so in this step, I do cover the six clobber passages and I Mm -hmm. reference some academic sources, Mm pro-gay and anti-gay sources, and I think are very level-headed and respectful. Mm -hmm. But I start out by couching this whole discussion of picking up your Bible again with the context of the church is very old and people are imperfect, as well as this is American politics over the last century. And homosexual theology didn't appear in the Bible till 1946, as many people know. Right. And the Bible has been, whether people like it or not, used as a political document. It Correct. just has. Yep. And so these are the facts. I will not tell you what to believe because my job is to give you permission to choose what you believe. But around the time that translations, I would say modern evangelical translations came to include the word homosexuality in the Bible, and it only occurred in one passage and then it spread to others. There was an actual historical context for that where communists were seen as mentally ill, dangerous people. And so were non-straight people dangerous Mm -hmm. and mentally ill people right and they were actually abused and it would be shocking behavior akin to nazi germany Mm -hmm. it's just insane that we would think that we are so different we're all human beings and we're all prone to fear and we're all prone to judgmentalism and making assumptions about people yeah so i do believe the bible is the inerrant word of god and as people pick up their Bible again, if they feel like it's not safe, I encourage them to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm-hmm. to listen to Jesus if they want to follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that seems like a pretty common sense piece of advice. Yeah. Because it's safe. Mm-hmm. And Jesus has nothing to say about it. Yep. Gay people, straight people, whatnot. Right. right. And I actually can't, I'm not a theologian, neither am I a therapist or a psychiatrist licensed. I'm just a regular person who feels like he has a little bit of common sense and has thought about (laughs) stuff and read books. (laughs) And been through stuff. (laughs) And been through stuff. But I just want to focus on what matters. And what matters to you is most important to me. So the last three steps are a little quicker. Step six is open your heart to what you used to dream. And that step I cover three taboo methods I actually used in really getting to what I wanted because my heart was crushed and I just feel like I didn't know myself. My family didn't talk about things. So I used a chakra healer and learned chakra meditation. Mm -hmm. I actually used tarot cards and I appealed to the prophet Daniel and talk in the last chapter about doctrines of free will, predestination, and how knowing God as a person makes sense of all that. And then I also talk about doing the wrong things for the right reasons and how the saints in the Bible who, who have, there's a great, it's a huge list. I didn't even write the whole list, but I made a list and the prophet Daniel was taken to captivity and he served Nebuchadnezzar and I think three other monarchs, four total, three different regimes. But like his only objection to becoming one of the learned wise men was dietary. He asked to be vegetarian. And so he would have studied all kinds of dark arts that Old Testament law would have forbidden. And so I'll just say it works for me. I don't push it on anyone, but it has really helped me. And I don't really read for myself so much anymore, but I uh, I found it helpful. If people are in situations where they just cannot talk to the people they used to love or they love still or are causing them grief. Sometimes I think someone else can help them to understand the situation for what it is. And it helped me. Right. 
And then I use the vision board and dream board in this step as well as a discipline for knowing what you want, asking yourself what you want is important Mm -hmm. and what God wants. The uh, seventh step is wait to hear God in your relationships. And in this step, I talk about more mature boundaries as you go out into relationships around you. And I talk again about your feelings and they're, they're central in being able to discern, is this relationship building me up or is it tearing me down? If you feel afraid or angry and you just can't work it out with somebody, that relationship's probably not building you up. And if you feel happy or joyful, that relationship might likely be building you up. Mm-hmm. And that is probably the main bit for that step. And then the final step is serve through loving without agreeing. And in this step, I recap the other steps, but I also implement one last exercise, which is about taking stock of when you judge your own feelings and judge your own decisions, because that will block you from happiness as well. Mm-hmm. And then once you've gotten familiar with that idea, take stock of when you judge other people's feelings and other people's decisions. Throughout my book, that's the eight steps. Mm-hmm. I I love Jesus so much. And I believe I followed him from a very young age. I include a lot of words of Jesus in my book, not as me trying to be right, because I don't think Jesus calls us to be right. I just think he calls us to follow him and to focus on what matters. Mm-hmm. That is the way that I incorporate the Bible into this book. Excellent. Thank you, Carter. And thank you for being willing to to express to others that they have a choice and to express to others that your way may not totally be their way, but they get to choose, you know, and if, if you found what you needed, if your clients are finding what they needed, it is definitely something to consider. If you're struggling out there and you really are having difficulty, you know, trying to figure out how to be happy and how to get through some of these difficult times with family, with relationships, with your own coming out process, you know, following these steps are not just for one thing in your life. I mean, these steps are relevant for, for living your life really. (laughs) And, you know, being able to open yourself up, to know yourself, to forgive yourself, to forgive others, to reconcile with people. And if you can't to release your, your connection to that desire to reconcile, you know, that sometimes we have to let go of someone we love, not only for, for their betterment, but for ours, that we, you know, it goes both ways that sometimes releasing another person will be for their betterment because they have to then deal with the disconnection from us. What will they learn on the other side? You know, as we're learning to detach, will they learn to attach in a more non-judgmental way? You know, a crisis creates change on both sides. Mm. And so we have to be willing to let that person grow away from us if they cannot grow with us. And so I think these steps are really relevant for so many things that we find ourselves dealing with today. And I hope that people will take advantage of leaning in and seeing if they work for them. So let's talk about this book launch that's happening this Thursday, this (laughs) Thursday evening. (laughs) I'm on, I'm on the zoom call. I signed up. (laughs) Y'all come. That's awesome. So how can people, um, uh, you're going to make sure that I have the link today and I'm going to put that on the Gay With God um, show page this afternoon when this goes live. So they'll have it there. But is there any other place that they can get it or where they need, to, what they would need to do in order to join? Yeah. So just make sure you RSVP using the link that will be in the description. And then if you want to reach out to me, you don't need to, but you should receive information to join up on that Zoom call. If you ever have trouble, though, you can email me at carterholmes2 at gmail.com, and I'll make sure you get the information. Okay. Awesome. So this Thursday, what can they expect when they join the launch? The launch is at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Thursday, and I think that's the 27th. Correct. You won't be asked to speak. All that will happen is that there will be a series of authors releasing books, including myself, and you will have the opportunity to 
get first dibs on free access to the book by showing up to the book launch and it should be a party. (laughs) <laughs> yay <laughs> we're going to party so even though we're not in the same room bring whatever you want to your zoom call <laughs> to party with and we will all be together <laughs> absolutely that's awesome is there anything else carter before we close uh today is there anything else that is on your heart or mind that you want to share with folks in this time to speak with them i just want to tell the listeners that midge does a great job and that she makes space for people that need to speak and she makes a big difference. So thank you for listening as well and for supporting her and please um, share. I'm not exactly sure how podcasts go, but (laughs) spread the word because this is a good podcast. Well, thank you, Carter. Thank you. Um, And I appreciate that. So guys, um, I want to thank Carter for honoring us again with at the gay with God podcast and for sharing his faith journey and how he is coming through all the things that he's experienced. And if you want to to hear the first podcast um, where we spoke to Carter, that was on 8-15-2022. So go back and search for the first one. Uh, If you're hearing this one, then you'll definitely want to uh, hear what he talked about before. So find that one and listen to that one as well. And I want to thank you listeners for coming back each week, supporting, sharing, subscribing, reviewing this podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. If you want more information about the launch, please go to the empoweredmidge.podbean.com uh, show page when this is published, and you will be able to then get the information you need to join on Thursday. If you are listening to this podcast and you are questioning whether you can be gay and be in a relationship with the God of your understanding, if you identify as LGBTQIA+, or even if you're not even sure if you're gay yet, God has always been within you. Even when you didn't know it, you have always been gay with God. Check out our Facebook group, Gay With God, where we do a monthly Zoom group entitled My Faith Journey. If you need support to help yourself coming out with your faith journey or you're coming out, contact Carter or you can contact me. You can find me at empoweredmidge.podbean.com. Scroll all the way down to the bottom and see how you can connect with me. So thank you, everybody. Stay tuned. See how you can join the Gay With God community. And don't forget, go sign up for that book launch. See y'all next week. Love ya. I want to invite you to become a part of the Gay With God community. How can you do that? Stay connected by messaging me your thoughts and comments in the comment section under the downloads of the show on the Gay With God show page. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen and share, share, share so we can increase our community outreach and be a light to those who are struggling to claim their faith. Consider being a sponsor so I can highlight your service in our community. We are all worthy of respect and a relationship with the God of our understanding. I want to thank you in advance for supporting this podcast. Together, we as a community will keep this show visible and our community stronger. Deep gratitude to my friend Tim McClendon of Tim McClendon Music for allowing me to use an excerpt from Interlude 4 a song found on his CD entitled Sundance.